also members Mendez, Menchaca, Kozlovich, Volone, Salamanca, uh, Idanis Rodriguez, uh, Jennifer Gibson, Mark Levine, and Borelli. So thank you all for being here. I don't know why I mentioned some last names and some everybody's names here. <laughs> so <coughs> good afternoon. We do have a, a lot on the agenda, as will be happening <laughs> in the next couple, in the next stated. The council will begin today by voting on the appointment of Thomas Sorrentino to the Tax and Limousine Commission as recommended by the Brooklyn delegation. We will also vote on multiple land use items, including the rezoning of Whitlock and 165th Street in the Bronx to facilitate the development of two fully affordable community and residential buildings and the public siting of 4545 and 4302 8th Avenue in Brooklyn to allow for the construction of two 332 seat public primary schools serving community school district 15. Uh, both council members Salamanca and Menchaca, I know are extremely proud and very happy and they should be. They represent the districts these uh, developments are happening and that we definitely would like to invite them to step up and speak on behalf. I will allow uh, seniority and I'll ask Councilman <laughs> Menchaca to come up and then I'll give it back to Ms. Salamanca. That's right, you, you have seniority. Uh, but but um, both of our projects deserve uh, all the praise. So today I will be urging my colleagues in the City Council to be approving both of these applications for these two new schools. These two new schools are a part of a, a new group of now five that are in process that will be coming to Sunset Park in District 15 and 20. Over 20% of the seats that are funded and cited and will be on their way are gonna be 20% citywide of the new schools are coming to Sunset Park. That only happens when community and government work together and I'm really happy that we are going to be uh, approving them today. Our new school will incorporate landmark exterior sections of our neighborhood's historic but long abandoned 68th police precinct building. Sunset Park has decided how to preserve our history and help relieve the area's chronic overcrowded, uh, overcrowding emergency. The recovery of the old 68 precinct for the 332 seat primary school has been specifically engineered to preserve the landmark brick exterior. For over 30 years, this structure has suffered damage and decay in the private hands. Uh, so now it will return permanently as a public owned building uh, for its service to our community. Uh, I congratulate the local schools and preservation advocates, School District 15, Community Board 7, along with local residents who have been collaborating so carefully and thoughtfully on this topic uh, through the many public hearings that we've had. Actions that affect the landmark building will continue uh, in conversation with the School Construction Authority. So I'm really excited that we will ensure that the most appropriate and final design uh, will be presented to the community uh, to preserve that character and inspire generations to come. I'm really excited to, and then hopefully coming back soon to approve more buildings for schools in our neighborhood. Thank you. Good afternoon, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, today I am pleased uh, to support uh, 1125 Whitlock uh, Avenue, which will bring over 470 units to my community in the Bronx. Uh, since first hearing about this project, I've been excited, notably because it will replace what's currently there, which is rundown garages and other light industrial businesses. Uh, so needless to say, new development is welcome here. However, I work diligently with my team here at City Hall, uh, the council, HPD, and the development team to make sure that uh, this project works for the community. And um, as a result, I was able to successfully negotiate with all involved. And today I'm happy to say that this project is one that we built for the people of the South Bronx. As always, I have four for a wide uh, mix of affordability, including nearly 150 units at 40% of AMI or less, uh, including larger units as well. With the new HPD term sheets requiring a 10% set aside for the formerly homeless, we ensured that these units were of larger sizes to provide for formerly homeless families, particularly with children. I was very adamant, and as a result, we were in conversations until very late uh, Sunday night on ensuring that, a great, uh, that there was a commitment in terms of local hiring uh, and uh, with uh, W. MBE outreach, and as a result, we set a goal of 30% for subcontractors and laborers to force the community involvement. Uh, we were also able to maintain or to attain a commitment on permanent jobs, ensuring good paying jobs with benefits once the building is completed. 
And once the project is completed, we have ensured that there will be adequate safety and surveillance, publicly accessible open space, a new community mural, lighting, and sanitation. With the approval of this project, I'm proud to say that since taking office 16 months ago, this will be my sixth ULERP, and I've been able to uh, approve and reshape over 4,000 units of 100% affordable housing for the South Bronx. Thank you. Congratulations. Um, on the legislative side, the council will begin by voting on intro 1668. Yes, 1668, sponsored by Council Member Rosie Mendez, which would extend the enactment date of introduction 1233A, prohibiting the use of wild or exotic animals in circus performances, and previously passed at the June 21st stated meeting, now move the date to October 1st, 2018. Uh, Council Member Mendez will say a few words. Thank you, Madam Speaker. When we passed 1233, we said we were gonna come back because we realized that six months may not be enough time for circuses to transition animals out of their um, business model. And we thought that it was only appropriate and fair to allow them more time. This would now give any circuses coming to New York until October 1st of 2018 for them to transition animals out of their existing um, programs. And I look forward to us passing that today. Thank you very much. Okay. Next, the council will vote on introduction 1234A, sponsored by council member Rafael Salamanca, which would require the Department of Transportation to provide notice to affected council members and community boards of the installation of new muni meters covering at least four contiguous blocks. And Councilman Salamanca. Thank, uh, <clears throat> thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, introduction 1234 is the easiest uh, intro number to remember. <laughs> and uh, well, basically, it will require the Department of Transportation to provide notice uh, to affected council members and community boards of the installation of new muni meters. Uh, this bill will also allow affected council members and community boards to submit recommendations uh, to DOT about the notice and would require DOT to review recommendations and or comments prior to the installation. Community boards would also be allowed to request a presentation on the installation. As many as you know, I'm a product of the local community board and strongly believe that our community boards are our eyes and ears on what issues are most pressing in our neighborhoods. Since joining the council, I have depended on the five community boards that cover my district to help me in shaping policy, land use items, and the variety of issues facing the South Bronx. Empowering them when it comes to siting of things like muni meters only works to benefit all of us, which is why I have proposed this legislation and I'm proud to have over 36 sponsors. Uh, while it's not the sexiest bill, intro 1234, I believe works to do what we were sent to do here in City Hall to improve the quality of life of our constituents every day, in, whether it's big or small. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. The Council will also vote on intro 1411A, sponsored by Council Member Joe Borelli, which would require that what, whenever a capital project is occurring on an athletic field under Parks Department jurisdiction, the agency implementing the project must install a linked walkway and public sidewalk if neither had existed before. Councilmember Borelli. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I certainly wanna thank the speaker for her, her support in this bill. I also wanna thank the Parks Committee Chairman Mark Levine, but before I really thank him, I wanna embarrass him a little bit uh, because this bill really started about a year ago when I took parks chairman to see some of the beautiful, wonderful wooded parks we have on Staten Island. And this is Mark Levine doing some sweet jumps oh. on a mountain bike. I had a stunt double. Yeah. <laughs> I'll tweet this slow motion that? I will, I, will, I will tweet this picture out uh, to everyone after the event. Because it is great. But. The, the South Shore of Staten Island is a very unique place. I'm, I'm probably the only council member who can, uh, within steps of his house, go to the beach, go bass fishing, go saltwater fishing, go mountain biking, hiking, see birds, the whole gamut uh, of outdoor things. Uh, and that's one of the benefits to being uh, a resident of Staten Island, is, is these wonderful opportunities. However, when Parks Department builds fields and playgrounds on Staten Island, they oftentimes like to neglect to build sidewalks. And it's a cost factor. Uh, and there are other environmental factors. They frankly have prioritized trees at times uh, over the construction of sidewalks. And this is one of those bills that makes you question why do we even need to legislate it and 
really there is no good answer. And had Parks Department just been uh, more forthcoming uh, and more cooperative on building sidewalks uh, in the past, I wouldn't have to stand here requiring them to do so. Uh, and uh, if not for uh, Chairman Levine really taking this issue up and coming out uh, and experiencing what we're talking about, uh, this bill really would not have moved. And of course, the Speaker for having her support. And of course, the other sponsors who uh, are familiar with some of the parks on Staten Island. It's absurd to think you would build a field for three or four soccer fields, have parking for two or three cars, uh, and then uh, anticipate people don't park on the streets or, or those people then wouldn't have to get to the field. So it's uh, a mistake that is being rectified by the Parks Department and uh, unfortunately through this legislation, but fortunately we are passing it. So thank you. Hmm, Mark, I remember when we sat down when I was coming out of being uh, chair of Parks, I said, why don't you go to your committee members districts and like find out a little bit about their concerns in the parks area. Bike, so. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that's great, great, thank you. Uh, on the Parks Department trend, the council will be voting on intro 407A, sponsored by council member Jimmy Vaca, which would require the Department of Parks and Recreation to provide notice of changes to capital projects greater than 10% of the original contract value, greater than $500,000 to council members from whom the project's funding originated. This is obviously uh, very important information. We get very frustrated with our parks capital projects, and a lot of times there's a lot of changes that happen and delay projects. Councilmember Rock is not here, uh, but definitely thank him and Councilmember Levine uh, for facilitating that, uh, that bill. Intro 671A, sponsored by Councilmember Paul Vallone, would require the Department of Transportation to survey all intersections with traffic control signals that are adjacent to a school or park and do not currently have pedestrian countdown displays for the purpose of determining whether pedestrian countdown displays should be installed at such intersections. Um, this bill would also require the Department of Transportation to install pedestrian countdown displays at all intersections that the department determines should have such displays within two years of the completion of that survey. Councilmember Vallone. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, these are those type of bills, like Councilmember Borelli said, that you would think we wouldn't have to do, but we need to do because we need to protect, especially our children next to our schools, our seniors next to our parks. Uh, you would think we'd have our countdown clocks ready already at the in intersections, but it's just not there yet. This bill is gonna require it, study it, and mandate it to be done. It's part of our safe streets, safe schools that we've been pushing. Um, we're working on other pieces of legislation together to make sure that those complete slow zones around the schools and parks are implemented. This is the first step. So I wanna thank the speaker, uh, thank our transportation committee, Adonis Rodriguez, for their leadership, uh, Jonathan Schott and, and Ahmed Nazar, my office, for doing all of this putting it together and working with, believe it or not, we had our principals, our teachers, our parents, all standing with us on this because if you can't cross the street safely, then we've got problems. And this is real, this bill is really gonna address that, so I'm looking forward to having the vote today in support. So thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Thank you. When an individual is arrested, their money, vehicle, or other property is seized, vouchered, and classified by the NYPD. Introduction 1000B, sponsored by Council Member Richie Torres, would require the NYPD to publish an annual report detailing such property seizure, uh, uh, property seized and retained in the preceding calendar year and disaggregated by borough and police precincts. Um, I think this is kind of interesting in light of the recent decisions by Attorney General Sessions with regards to some federal regulations about seizures. Uh, so I think it comes at a really appropriate time to be able to get that information and look at the numbers and see how it changes over time. Councilmember Torres was unable to join us today, but definitely thank him for his work on this bill. That represents a welcome addition to the many transparency measures this council has sought to bring to the New York City Police Department. Next, we're gonna vote on introduction 1646A, sponsored by Transportation Committee Chair Idanis Rodriguez, which would require, oh, I'm sorry, his nephew, Eric, is here today, shadowing his uncle, so that's nice. Uh, next, we're, so we're gonna vote on this bill which would require four higher vehicle bases to provide a means to allow passengers to tip their drivers using the same method of payment you used to pay for the fare. Uh, so I'll ask the chair to please uh, speak on that. Thank you, Speaker. Well, thank you, Speaker Melissa Marguerite and my colleague for supporting this bill. Uh, and thank you again for all the advocate group. For the first time ever, we will require in city law that there be a tipping option provided for all apps-based car services in New York City. 
This is a major step forward for drivers who have seen wage and earning fall over the past five years, especially for those whose service provider did not allow a tip option in their app. I also want to highlight the work of the Independent Drivers Guild and the machine machinists, including Ryan Price and Jim Conigliaro, whose work with their membership on this issue, and they have helped to get us to this point. We are making a major wage nationally with this move, and, and already we are seeing this impact. The impact with the largest app-based provider in the country now adding a tipping option for the drivers. According to a report by the IDG, by not including a tipping option, drivers for this large company were left for a forego of $300 million in earnings that could have been used to support their family. Indeed, Lyft, which has long had a tipping option, has already seen its drivers take home $250 million in tips during its time of, oper of operating here. This is about restoring dignity to the, to the profession, ensuring that drivers can make a career out of it, of it and not just, and, and just use it as a side gig. Thank you to our staff who work on this bill, Aminta Kilawan, as well as Transportation Committee staff, uh, Faisa Malik, Jonathan Maserano, Emily Rooney, Brandon West, Chima Obicherry, and legislative staff, Matt uh, Gerwald, Laura Papa, and Rob Newman. And thank you as well to my staff, Jose Luis eh, and Rosa Murphy and Stephanie Emiliano. Hoy estamos aquí eh, pasando una ley que tiene que ver con proveerle a los choferes eh, la opción de que los pasajeros le puedan dar un, su propina. Gracias al liderazgo de la vocera Melissa Marberito y de todos los colegas, estos choferes tendrán dinero extra para llevarlo a su familia. Thank you. Eric, pay attention because you're going to get quizzed on that bill later on by your <laughs> uncle. So. Uh, unfortunately, New York City has one of the nation's highest rates of food insecure seniors. Part of this problem stems from the fact that not enough eligible seniors in or res uh, sorry, that not enough eligible seniors enroll in or recertify for the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. Introduction 1519A, sponsored by Councilmember Karen Kozlowicz, would seek to increase coordination between the Department of Social Services and the Department for the Aging to promote awareness of SNAP through a public campaign targeted at seniors and their caregivers. The bill also requires the Department of Social Services in coordination with the Department for the Aging to establish and implement a SNAP enrollment and recertification program, ensuring that SNAP enrollment and recertification programming is taking place at all senior centers in the city. And I'll ask Karen to say a few words now. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The average Social Security benefit for a couple that both receive benefits is $2,212 a month. Unfortunately, for too many seniors, this is their sole source of income. To be clear, 2,212 is the average, and many are receiving less than that average. With such low income levels, one anticipates that there would be a reduced food intake, as well as reduced quality and a reduced variety of food among seniors. Currently, couples with a pre-tax monthly income of $1,736 receive a supplemental nutrition assistance program known as SNAP, benefit of $357. It is readily apparent how critical this benefit is. Yet, we have too many needy seniors who are not availing themselves of this SNAP benefit. Intro 1519A would require the Commissioner of Social Services in coordination with the Commissioner of DIFTA to establish and implement a program to enable enrollment and recertification in SNAP at all senior centers. Such program would, at a minimum, enable seniors to enroll in the SNAP assistance program in person at each senior center. Additionally, the Department of Social Services shall, in coordination with the Department for the Aging, design and implement a public campaign to increase the awareness of seniors and their caregivers 
of the benefits of this supplemental nutrition assistant program. This bill is very important and we will be helping many seniors to get the right nutrition that they need. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Um, continue our efforts to bring transparency and accountability to the Department of Correction. Introduction 1136A, which I sponsored, would require the law department to provide semi-annual public reports on civil actions filed against the Department of Correction and the department's employees, including the amount of any financial payment by the city as part of a settlement or other disposition. The law department would also be required to share this list with the controller, the Department of Investigation, the Department of Correction, and the Board of Correction. This legislation will allow for comprehensive and coordinated efforts to identify trends of misconduct in our city jails, and I'm proud to sponsor it. And finally, um, but, uh, the council will vote on introduction 214B, sponsored by council members Mark Levine and Vanessa Gibson, which would require the Office of the Civil Justice Coordinator to establish programs to provide all tenants facing eviction with access to legal services within five years. I just came from a very successful celebration earlier today uh, that the sponsors uh, were getting a lot of accolades for and they deserve it. Uh, as I said in my, state, in my February State of the City address, the establishment of the Civil Justice Coordinator Office has been an exceptional high point for this council, and we are proud to see the work of that office expanded. Losing your home is a devastating and life alter, uh, alternating experience, altering experience. That would not happen simply because you don't know your rights. This attention to the needs of our most vulnerable residents will keep families together and in their homes, and that importance cannot be overstated as we face a concerning lack of affordable housing throughout this city, and I would say this nation. I'm profoundly impressed by the work of the two council members beside me, Mark Levine and Vanessa Gibson. I definitely invite them to come up and take the proper credit for this uh, uh, advocacy and for the passing of this legislation. Negotiating these types of bills are never easy, and so definitely a shout out also to the staff uh, for all of their attention, and I know the, comp uh, the ongoing coordination with the sponsors of the bill. Uh, this took a lot, a lot of work to get to this day, and so they obviously deserve credit as we celebrate in this occasion. So with that, I'll hand it off to you guys. You decide who speaks first. <laughs> very, very briefly, thank you. Um, I'm pleased to share a video with you of Joe Borelli, uh, <laughs> who came to my district to help a tenant who was being evicted. Is that what you uh, I will note that he snuck out of the room. He's actually, uh, he, he would not want to be mistaken as being a co-sponsor of the bill, although uh, everyone up here has been uh, uh, um, amazing leaders on this issue, uh, uh, including, of course, uh, the wonderful Vanessa Gibson, my partner in this journey, and, and Adonis and Carlos, who were early and stalwart co-sponsors. Um, but a special thank you to you, Madam Speaker. Uh, you really have put New York City and the New York City Council back at the forefront of policymaking nationally at a time when the country needs New York City in the lead, and you've done that on civil justice, you've done that on access to counsel, immigrant rights, um, and this bill clearly uh, making New York City the first place in America, the first jurisdiction uh, to guarantee access uh, for all tenants to an attorney. It, it's such a desperately needed bill because for years, Landlords, unscrupulous landlords, have been using housing court as a weapon, uh, hauling tenants into court, often on very flimsy grounds, because they knew in almost every case the tenant would not have an attorney. Um, less than 10% traditionally had had attorneys. And the result, not surprisingly, tens of thousands of evictions a year, and in a painfully high number of those cases, we know that if the tenant had just had an attorney, they would have been able to stay in their home. And we're putting an end to that with this bill. No longer is anyone going to lose their home just because they couldn't make an obvious legal defense. In the process, this is going to impact our homeless crisis. You know, the single biggest cause of family homelessness is not addiction, it's not mental health problems, it is eviction. And so we are going to prevent homelessness with this bill. We're also going to save affordable housing. Thousands of units a year are lost because after an eviction, the landlord uses the loopholes of vacancy decontrol to go market rate. And this bill will save our city money. Uh, you don't need a PhD in economics to realize that you can either spend $2,500 up front for an attorney that might keep someone in their home, or if they land in a homeless shelter after an eviction, we as a city spend more than $45,000 a year. So this is actually a fiscally prudent bill. And we know it works because for the last three years, 
while we've been working on the legislation, the city council, under the speaker's leadership, and the mayor as well, have increased by tenfold the amount of money that we're allocating to anti-eviction legal services. We went from low single digits number of tenants with attorneys in housing court to over a quarter today just because of what we have won in the budget. And the eviction rate in New York City has dropped by 24% in that time. So we know this works. And when we take 214 to scale, it is going to have a profound impact on the lives of tenants in private housing, in public housing. It's going to be a major change for the city and a new day for tenants. And I'm so grateful to all my colleagues, to our speaker, to, of course, Councilmember uh, Vanessa Gibson uh, for leading this historic bill forward. Thank you. Ditto. Good afternoon, everyone. It is such an honor and a privilege to stand here um, after over three years of advocacy of making sure that Intro 214 could see this day when we effectively pass this legislation and become the first municipality in the country to mandate universal access to counsel. I am so proud, I am so honored on behalf of my district and certainly on behalf of the Bronx, which on average sees about 11,000 evictions each year. And we know those are the documented cases of evictions. And we know that has a profound effect on children, on families, on seniors, on vulnerable New Yorkers. So today we take a buy a bold and giant step forward in making sure that we empower tenants, we give them lawyers when they go to court, we balance the scales, we provide equity and justice in housing court. And I represent housing court in the Bronx. And I've visited along with Councilmember Levine and others, and we've seen the chaotic uh, nightmare of what housing court is, and we simply want that to change. So today is a great day for so many tenants and families in New York City, and I'm so proud. Passing this bill really for me and my colleagues affirms what we already know, that fundamentally it is a right to achieve and access quality and affordable housing. It is not a luxury, but it is simply a fundamental right. Thanks to so many of the protections in Intro 214, we will decrease the number of families that are facing eviction. We will lower and lessen the burden on our shelter system. We will stabilize families and we will simply put, keep families in their homes. Over the next five years, as this bill is phased in, we will work closely with the administration to make sure that all New Yorkers have access to these legal protections. I am so proud that because of the advocacy of so many, including the leadership of our speaker, that when we are talking about Intro 214, we are talking about, as well, residents of the New York City Housing Authority. And I represent 12 NYCHA developments, and they are also facing the burden of eviction as well. And so they are a part of this, and I'm very grateful for that. This bill is making an investment in our families, in our tenants, and it's really and truly giving families exactly what they need. We know that knowledge is power, but having an attorney is even more powerful. And so through this legislation, we are not just talking the talk, we are walking the walk. We are making sure that tenants understand their rights, and when they go to housing court, they will be empowered. I want to thank my colleague and friend throughout this entire journey. It's been an incredible opportunity working side by side with Council Member Mark Levine. I want to thank our speaker for always being a champion and recognizing that we must fundamentally achieve equity and justice in our housing court system. I want to thank Matt Gowald and Laura Popa and Rob Newman and Casey Addison, Sarah Gastelum, Kelly Taylor, uh, Aya Keefe, my chief of staff, Dana Wax, thank you for being an incredible team walking this journey with us. To every advocate, every civil legal service provider that has stood with us, the Right to Counsel Coalition, we say thank you. Today is a great day, and we will continue to stand up for every tenant in the city of New York. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Just a few words in Spanish, and then we'll take a couple of questions. Hoy votaremos sobre una serie de proyectos de ley. La prim el primer proyecto de ley tiene que ver cuando un individuo es detenido, su dinero, vehículo u otras propiedades son incautadas, avaladas y clasificadas por la policía de Nueva York. La legislación en la que estamos votando hoy exigirá que la policía de Nueva York publique un informe anual que proporcione detalles sobre tales acciones. Por otra parte, votaremos sobre una legislación, como mencionó el concejal Idanis Rodríguez, 
que va a requerir que las bases de vehículos de alquiler proporcionen un medio para permitir que a los pasajeros dar propinas a sus choferes utilizando el mismo método de pago utilizado para pagar la tarifa. Continuando con nuestros esfuerzos para aumentar la transparencia y rendición de cuentas al Departamento de Corrección, un proyecto de ley que patro, eh, patrocinado por mí y estamos votando hoy va a requerir que el Departamento de Leyes proporcione informes públicos sobre acciones civiles presentados contra el Departamento de Corrección y los empleados del departamento. Y finalmente, el Consejo votará sobre un proyecto de ley que va a requerir que la Oficina de Col del um, Coordinador de Justicia Civil establezca programas para proporcionar a todos los inquilinos que se encuentren expuestos al desalojo acceso a servicios jurídicos o servicios legales dentro de un periodo de cinco años. And with that, we will take any questions. Speak to him, or just talk away after we I'll familiar. just give you a very yeah, short answer, um, which is uh, Councilmember Borelli focused the bill um, on those cases where capital work is already being done, so it doesn't require a retrofit, which the Parks Department felt uh, would not be financially feasible. But if you're doing capital work now in a park with the play field, a ball field, then you do need to install sidewalk access. And that still will be a big victory for the park so system. In February, the Chamber of Commerce signed a similar bill to this one, which didn't do retroactive construction of sidewalks. Is that in the works in the process? Uh, it, it may be in how we trigger uh, the requirement. Uh, I wish uh, the council member hadn't run out because he didn't like the access to council bill. Uh, he would answer it himself. So we'll have we to can get, get the staff we'll get, to clarify we'll get to that point. Listen, in a, in, a, in a budget the size of this one, uh, this is a small amount of money we're talking about, and uh, we are currently in conversations. So I believe we will arrive at a point of agreement soon. I'm not going to speak to the comments of the mayor. I actually was out when he mentioned those. I, I know there's a lot of back and forth on that issue right now. Um, obviously, we're very concerned about low-level offenses, about not triggering any opportunities for people to be arrested. We've been talking about turnstile jumping. The issue of homelessness uh, continues to be a real challenge. The quality of life and the cost of living in the city is very high, and people ch face very challenging circumstances. Uh, and so I would not trivialize any of that. What? Oh, so listen, the, the issue of the MTA, uh, you know, is really our priority. We want to continue to focus on the conversation of the resources that are necessary to really bring our MTA system, uh, you know, into, into the century. Uh, I've been talking to the chair of transportation. I know we've been talking about doing an oversight hearing, so we want to really focus on what it is that we would like to cover. There is conversations at the MTA in the next couple of weeks. Uh, under Joe Loder's leadership, is about to issue a report uh, in terms of what their next steps are. Those are the things we want to focus on. And we hear from our constituents each and every day about the horrors, and we're hearing the reports. There's a lot of work that needs to get done, and I really want us all to focus on finding the solutions. I want to focus us on having conversations about how do we fix the existing MTA system. And on the issue of the food, I, I'm not, I don't really know that that's where the focus needs to be right now. I haven't taken a position on that issue, and I don't have all the details on where the thing stands, so I'd have to get back to you on that. Uh, 
listen, let me, let me be clear. Obviously, we all talk about the election system and the Board of Elections and the state laws and what, you know, the changes that we need to do, serious reforms that we have to undergo uh, clearly. I do wish uh, uh, David Greenfield the best. Obviously, this is an incredible opportunity that is before him. Uh, the laws are the laws. And my, you know, as much as, as we may not like certain aspects of the law, uh, then we have to work to change them. In the meantime, uh, if our colleagues are following the laws, then um, as, dis as unpalatable as some may find it, what is there to say, right? We have to change the way things are. I know we're talking about reforms at the state level. We're talking about board of election reforms, uh, the way things are done. Those, it's very intricate, very c confusing, uh, very detailed. Uh, but my understanding is that everything was adhered to. And if people have issues with those policies and regulations and laws, then that's an issue that has to be taken up with the appropriate individuals that can change it. I mean, those are things we have to look at. I think the conversation about reforms is, is present, but way overdue, and we have to do something about that. That is my understanding. That is my understanding until um, uh, anything else emerges otherwise. I'm, I'm, to be honest, I have not looked uh, at, the, at that race at all. I'm very focused on uh, my current district race and supporting the candidate that I have endorsed. And there are other women that I have endorsed, but I'm very much focused on the legacy in my district and who will be replacing it. Sure, very, very briefly, uh, this is a zip code based model. So the idea is that a tenant could show up at court and simply by giving their address, they can be assigned an attorney on the spot. Um, ideally, they would actually meet with that attorney before they come to court. And so with a zip code based model, we can mail people a postcard to their home. Uh, with the uh, commissioner of HRA, Steve Banks, has talked about prioritizing those zip codes um, which have a large amount of rent stabilized housing where this problem is most serious, rezone which send the most uh, rezone neighborhoods, upzone neighborhoods, and uh, zip codes which send the most families to homeless shelters. Uh, so it'll be a, a five year phase in zip code by zip code. Uh, on the NYCHA front, um, where we fought, I don't think it was explained as, as well as it could have been in detail, but we, we have not only access for uh, NYCHA residents in housing court, but also in administrative tribunals. And there, the bill does give uh, uh, HRA commissioners some latitude to develop a pilot while getting to full legal representation by year five. And the bill says that by October 1st, that pilot has to be up and running. Uh, it's up to HRA, but he's given, uh, I believe, his commitment to work with the city council in prioritizing. 